What is it, my ducks and drakes? Welcome to the Crawdale Lake. Today we are <laughs> we are reading Bad Moon Rising by Becca Nine One One. If you're wondering why we're starting at the fifth chapter, it's because I'm not. Uh, my baby brain started reading this when the book wasn't finished oh, about a year ago, actually, maybe even more. And I decided to wait until the book was completed to continue reading it, and then my baby brain realized that I didn't ask permission to read the book. So, after Be um, Becca commenting on two of my things, I am I'm thinking that she's okay with it, and the book is complete, so now I'm finishing it. I do not recommend you going back to my past Pop Pedro Louds and listening to those, because they're very bad. I recommend you reading the story on your own and then coming back here. If you really want to cringe today uh you could read my first maybe 20 wapedro louds it's the whole series this is technically the fifth book so fifth book fifth chapter let's go uh like i said becca 911 wrote this i'll leave their links in the description below please click because oh my gosh best best fan fiction writer i've ever did, did yeah <laughs> english is just not my thing today is it okay the fifth. Tick. To see wasn't ready for the wall to splinter, had have been there for as long as he dared to remember, keeping the worst of the darkness at bay, because they all loved Thomas in their own twisted way. They wanted to protect him, but not shelter him. The world was crafted out of spider webs and brittle lies, but Thomas could face it. He was strong. So they built the wall because they may love Thomas, but they were dark sides, and they weren't supposed to to exist. Their work was silent and invisible and painful because they were locked away parts of themselves just so that Thomas could be okay. The sea had been one of the first ones to start working on the wall. He knew how solid it was. Talk. It was supposed it wasn't supposed to splinter. Tick. When it shattered, something in his chest twisted sharply and he choked a pain and a gasp. A high-pitched kneeing noise erupted and spun through the air, getting louder and higher until he couldn't hear anything else. The noise went under his skin and into his veins and began to tear apart everything that he was. A monster was assembling in him, and he could feel the anger writhing and surging. Poison was spreading through him, and he could feel the coldness coming to claim him again. Thomas. Talk. The shadows would devour his host. They would rip into him and tear him into pieces, and then Thomas would be rebuilt into something dark and soulless and inhumane. To see couldn't let them. The dark sides would try to stop him. They would fight him because he wouldn't want to go back. They wouldn't build the wall again. But the seat had to. For Thomas. Tick. Except he couldn't make his body move. He gritted his teeth and fought the spreading darkness in his veins, but it was no use. His full energy was returning to him. He was burning up in his bloodstream. Soon enough, to see would be a monster because it wasn't the dark Thomas should fear. It was what was in the dark that should terrify him. Because if Thomas looked into the dark, to see would be the one looking back. Tick. The wall. Rima said as he appeared in Deceit's room, voice slightly strained. D, the wall is broken. Deceit bowed his teeth in malicious grin. Yes, he agreed slowly and delighted in the cold shiver that crept across his shoulders. And isn't it <laughs> glorious? Remus's face lit up with twisted sort of glee. Deceit's hand flexed a dark position, finally finished chilling his veins. How oh, he missed this. How alive he felt. How powerful. Thomas should share in the raw rush. Talk. The wall had been a terrible idea. To see it met Remus's eyes, feel like something hysterical building in his chest. Ho oh, my dear Duke. He purred, running his tongue over his teeth. His breath hissed out of him. What fun we are going to have. Remus laughed, and it was a wild and unrestrained and deranged, and for a moment to see felt a flicker of horror at what Thomas would have to face. 
His host wouldn't know what to do with the sudden swell of horrific feelings, especially not if Patton was having his own negative effect. Tick. Oh well, deceit hadn't felt this good in far too long. Talk. The others are waiting for you, Remus said, voice suspiciously aloof. His eyes were blown wide with glee and power, and deceit's misgivings vanished like smoke on the wind. Are you coming? Oh, I'll be there, Deceit promised, his sharp teeth gleaming. There's just something I have to do first. Remus hummed, a knowing smirk twisting his lips. Don't keep me waiting, <laughs> he purred. It'd be terribly lonely if you betray us like Virgil did. Tick. Hmm. Was that a warning? Deceit nodded his head, watching the narrow eyes of the duke fading away, cackling wildly, and yet there'd been something vulnerable about him. Perhaps Remus was feeling the strain of Virgil's absence. Perhaps the others were not as unfeeling as they claimed. Perhaps the resurgence of their full powers had awoken, and the need to be whole again reappeared. And they couldn't do that without Virgil. Talk. So, what would happen if Deceit decided he didn't want them anymore? Tick. His low laugh hung in the air as he slipped away through the shadows to check on the wall. The darkness held him tightly, slithered along his skin like cold fingers, and Deceit chuckled. We'll rise again, he whispered into the nothingness. My old friend, we will rise. The darkness recoiled in excitement, pulsing against the seat's skin. Talk. You have to let me go, though, my dearest darkness. There's something I must attend to before we regain our control over Thomas. Tick. They allowed him to appear before the remains of the wall, glimmering shards of willpower laid frustrated on the ground, a gaping hole of nothing. Every step that the seat took made a crunchy sound as he walked over proof of his old heart. He had cared once. He shuddered once. What a truly awful thing. Talk. Was that what Virgil felt when he left? The wrongness in his own skin? The sense of utter despair that choked him as he stared at the remains of one of the only good things he had ever done? He would built the wall to protect Thomas. And here he was, standing on its remains. How could he be so unaffected by it? Why was he so unaffected by it? Tick. Surely this internal conflict was what drove Virgil away into the arms of the light sides. Surely deceit wasn't alone in his misgivings and his guilt and his disgustingly human feelings. Talk. If the others found out, he would never escape them again. Tick, talk. Chapter 6 Deceit was the sight of many faces. He switched between them constantly, assuming the personality of whoever he needed to be just to survive the moment. He'd almost turned it into a game. Who would Deceit be today? He was a woolen man made up of many woolen threads, except sometimes they tangled and he lost himself. And then the wall broke and all those strings inside of him melted into a blob of identity, and suddenly, Deceit didn't know who he was. He was a monster in his veins, and he had the power of his tongue, and he had the snarl in his throat. He had a heart that was bleeding, and he had a chest that was hurting, and a horrible sense that something was terribly wrong. Deceit was losing the game. He hated losing. A dark sort of heat threaded through his veins and warmed his wrists, made him feel full, full of malice and full of anger and full of desperation to be better than the world. But something was still missing. Something that stopped him from being whole and balanced and strong. Something was missing. The seat barred his teeth in frustration, his entire body cushioned by the familiar soothing darkness that clung to him. It had carried him away from the remains of the wall. He held him tightly as he tried to wade through the sudden fluxation of power. He had it all back. It had all come back to him, and now he was hot under his skin, and he was dangerous. But he still wasn't whole. 
What am I missing? He hissed to the shadows, his voice low and sharp. Why isn't this my full power? Isn't this enough? Because it isn't. It used to be. Oh, how deceit used to flaunt on to strength before the wall. But now, deceit just felt hot and full and hollow. And it wasn't enough. He didn't understand. He hated that he didn't understand. He hated feeling stupid and small and weak. He hated not understanding the rules of his own game. It wasn't fair. All right. He breathed, swallowing down a rising hysteric anger that threatened to choke him. Take me to the others. The shadows obliged, twisting and ringing and twitching until the seed's feet touched the solid ground and he can see. Immediately, he fixes a lazy smirk on his face and waves off the darkness with an unimpressed wave. The power in his veins surged. Deceit managed not to flinch. Remus let out a cackle. <laughs> You're late, Deceit, he said, his wild eyes a little too focused on Deceit's face. He was looking for something. Deceit wouldn't let him find. He hummed non-committingly. Just checking on the wall. Ramus's eyes sharpened, a dark sort of vacant glee sh shadowing his manic expression. He twirled his club in his hands to see eyed the weapon. How the duke could wield such an unrefined weapon made no such sense. The seat peered elegance. Nothing about Remus was elegant. Well, the seat didn't like Remus either, so fair was fair. We must strike at the white sides. A voice hissed from somewhere the seat couldn't see quickly before Thomas starts to suspect anything and actively tries to restrain, restrain us. No, no, that was the opposite of what they needed to do. The seat knew what it would feel like to succumb to new power swelling in him. He knew how addictive it could be, how freeing. It would help him bring Virgil back because even Virgil couldn't resist the raw rush of dark. They could get Virgil back if Deceit would just submit and he almost did, because he'd figured out that Virgil was the thing missing. They all needed Virgil to feel whole. All of them were missing the last piece of the shadow puzzle, and it almost hurt to see to want him back. Him. Back. He wanted it, and he wanted to protect his host more. Thus, he needed to convince the others to rebuild the wall. They wouldn't like it, and he would have to fight, but Thomas couldn't fight them all and come out unscathed if they were unleashed upon the boy's coincidence nothing would ever be okay again thomas would be ruined give in the power in him soothed something pressed against the inside of his wrist deceit let out a measured breath come on play you can make it all the you can make it all go away. Give in. No. Just he couldn't let it do that to his host. No matter how strong and yearning was for Virgil to come home. He wanted Virgil back. He needed to protect Thomas. One outweighed the other. He made up his mind. He would rebuild the wall. Time's up, deceit. Something murmured in deceit's ear. And the dark side stepped into the familiar voice. The void was back. And he was talking again. And deceit was out of time. You made the wrong choice, Snake. You came so close, but alas, you have failed me. And so, I will take you as payment. What? Deceit cut off as pure cold gripped at his muscles and paralyzed him. His mouth closed with a click, and then his jaw locked. His vocal cords froze. He couldn't do anything, couldn't make any noise. No control had been stripped away from him between one breath and the next. He tried to make eye contact with Remus because the Duke may be uncivilized, but not a friend of Deceit. But he was right there and Deceit needed help. But Remus was turning away. And then Deceit's veins warmed to the point of burning pain. And Deceit was falling, 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 falling. Thomas' limbs stiffened. 
Joan frowned as Thomas cut off halfway through a sentence, eyes glancing over and becoming fixed on something nobody else could see. Talon tried as well, their voice growing louder in concern, but Thomas wasn't present at the moment. His throat was tight and his eyes had become unseeing, and all Thomas knew was that something was wrong and he needed help. He needed help, he couldn't make any noise, and he was falling, 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 falling. Virgil knew that he had what had happened the moment his veins darkened to a sickly black color. Something was pushing at the edge of his mind, but he couldn't let it in. The wall had broken. Power was returning to him. But he was a light side now, and to give in to the old sense of self would force him into an internal war. No. Virgil needed to push it away. He needed to be fully light in order to win the fight that would be coming. Because if the wall had broken... The dark side would be moving soon, and Virgil would be the one to fight them back. Not Patton, not Logan, not Roman. It'd be Virgil. There was a sharp pain in his temple, and he hissed, and then he was falling, falling, falling. Somewhere in the void, there was a flash of red light. Tick tock, a voice whispered maniacally. Chapter 7. The suit was not himself, and yet he was. Remus watched him through narrowed eyes and mouth pinched. He needed to be sure, needed to watch for just a little longer before he vocalized his suspicions. But the signs were all there. You'd have to be blind not to see them. Remus wasn't blind. He got the better eyesight out of the family, or maybe he was less of an idiot than his twin brother. Deceit met his eyes, cocking an eyebrow and tilting his head, smiling sharp sharply. Remus hated the fact that the chills ran across his skin. This deceit was dangerous. See something you like, my dear old duke? Deceit's voice was a purr, low and smooth, and oh so soft and gentle. Dangerous. Remus's lips curled into a crazy grin, and he let the gaze of childish sanity cloud the fact that he knew. <laughs> Just wondering, he said lazily, and Deceit's eyes flickered away for a moment. There, the seat that Remus knew would have never back down over nothing. This wasn't this deceit. Perhaps we should rebuild the wall. A test. It was a test, a challenge, a trial. To see what should pass with flying colors, Remus knew that. And yet... And yet whoever this was... Startled, mouth pinching into a tight line of betraying his emotion-fueled reaction. No. Not to see it hiss sharply, baring his teeth. Remus wrinkled his nose. To see it had never been this unrefined. The wall stays down. Virgil comes back. Now that was interesting. Virgil, why would Deceit be so focused on Virgil now, of all times? The wall had just been shattered. They should all be overwhelmed with their return energies. Of course, Remus had cheated all those years ago, so he was far from affected. But Deceit should have forgotten about this obsessive project to bring Virgil back. Only for the moment. What sort of effect do you think this whole situation is having over our little buddy? Remus mused out loud, tracking not to see its subtle reactions. After all, his energy should have returned to him. Maybe the sudden fluctuation of light dark balance will send him back off the morality track. Remus's grin suddenly went razor sharp. Perhaps, dearest snake, you have been affected most of all. Not the seed's hands twitched at his sides. Remus's eyes moved keenly. I'm fine. Not to see growled lowly. The seed had never growled like that before. Low and guttle and ugly. This thing, whoever or whatever it was, was not deceit. Remus was sure of that now. There was something too off, too different, too 
This was not his deceit. Remus hummed knowingly, turning away from the imposter with a sly grin. Perhaps this could work in his favor. All he had to do was exploit not to see its weak, fluctuating personality. Maybe if Remus used enough of his energy, he could take control of the puppet strings. Maybe he could finally get to see it to help him ruin the pathetic excuse for creativity that Thomas so adored. You see me. A voice breathed into his ear, and Remus stiffened, flicking his eyes around in an attempt to see who was speaking. His gaze snagged on that deceit, who was staring blankly at the ground and his mouth hanging open. I, I see you too. You're the one pretending to be deceit, Remus said quietly, and the air around him rippled. Dark amusement brushed against his thoughts. You are clever. Perhaps I should have chosen you over the snake. Hmm, I don't know. Snakes have a way more way of pleasing everyone. <laughs> more amusement. Remus was sure he could detect a hint of ex extrabation. Good. I want Virgil back, the strange voice emitted in a hissing sort of whisper. I need him. His energy. Deceit failed to deliver. Will you feel me too? I wonder. Remus cackled, short and sharp and deranged. Why would I do anything for you? He asked loudly. I don't know you. Probably have more power than you also. Cold gripped at his neck. It crept down his spine like ice. His veins froze. His breath rattled in his chest. He could taste snow on his tongue. He quickly squeaked. Slightly. Weapon dropping to the ground. Not to see it slowly lifting his head, a smile too wide to be natural. There were entirely too many teeth. Remus did not get afraid. But he was afraid now. You will return Virgil to me, the voice hissed. I will return to see its consciousness so that he may help you. If you fail, I will reclaim your spirit too. And then I will tear Thomas's mind to shreds. Do you wish that upon your host, dearest Remus? No. No, he didn't. Remus lived a great chaos, that was true. But he loved his host. Thomas was good. Thomas was still young. Thomas was naive and stupid and strong-willed and caring that Remus would not let him be ruined by some cheap-ass horror movie nobody. I trust that, once I have brought Virgil back to the group, you'll tell me the specifics of where I'm where I'm to return him to. Remus thought a bit. Not a nothing in the cold evaporated from his body. See that it is done, Remus. To see its body jolted once before, going limp, and Remus watched through blurry eyes as shadows streamed and twirled, and to see its face slackened. Somewhere in the distance, a voice laughed and a clock ticked. Thomas stared down on his phone, feeling sick to his stomach. His hands shook, his breathing caught in his throat. Tears bubbled somewhere in the back of his eyes. He, he didn't. He couldn't. He, he dropped the device, the legs giving out on him. He sat on the couch and buried his hands in his hair, trying his best to breathe through the sudden and unnecessary panic. This wasn't Virgil. Induced. He knew that. He knew it. He knew it. What was happening? His phone buzzed responses to what he'd just done, what he didn't remember doing. He had to go. He had to go now. He leapt off the couch and fled out the front door, his breathing still too shallow, his thoughts still too scrambled. His phone lay on the floor, abandoned. On it, a single tweet that didn't make any sense. Tick-tock. The clock on the wall kept the time, each tick of the second hand, clinking with the bell that warmed of death. Tick-tock. 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 Chapter 8 Deceit lingered in the shadows of Patton's room and swore to himself that he was the only one there to terrorize the light side. It wasn't because the air was crisp and light, and Deceit was still trembling after having control of himself forcibly ripped away. It wasn't. He just wanted to climb his back to a former glory. He was here to hurt Patton, not to stop himself from hurting. 
It was moments like this that she almost ached to have Virgil back. Virgil, who had been by his side for far too many years, to just leave him like that. Virgil, who had helped him build the wall, helped him to contain the true hordes of Thomas's physique. Virgil, who had been his... his friend. Deceit wanted him back. Tick. Tock. If you don't remove your presence from my head, I'll do everything in my power to ensure that the light sides win this battle. He snarled dangerously as the low voice in his head clicked in time with the passing seconds. It had not left him since. Since Remus had challenged the other. Virgil. It all ended with Virgil. Deceit was so very tired of chasing after someone who had spent a lifetime running. Virgil wouldn't come back to them, not willingly. No matter how much deceit longed for his presence, no matter how long Thomas needed Virgil to come back, he wouldn't. Virgil had torn apart the tapestry that was the dark sides. How could they be expected to be forgiving after that? For the sake of Thomas, deceit fully intended on not giving Virgil a choice. His brute brooding was cut short by Patton entering the room, emotions visibly scrambled. Finally, some sort of victory. Deceit seeped into the darkness, allowing his presence to expand and expand until every breath that Patton took was tainted with the horrible bitterness that deceit radiated. Go away! Patton shouted. His voice was mangled in massive, jagged fissy and an ugly emotion. You've already poisoned me enough. I do not need you hissing in my ear. You got what you wanted. Leave me be. Oh, Patton. Deceit had gotten everything but what he wanted. Still, he had won the battle. So Deceit let his breath hiss out of him before he let himself fall backwards, tumbling through the darkness as he fell and fell and fell and fell. The shadows coiled around his arms, pressing down into his wrists, and his pulse leapt and jumped. He closed his eyes and let himself go blank. He would fall and fall and fall and fall, and nobody would ever break him out of it, because nobody cared what games Deceit was playing. Deceit didn't even care what games he was playing anymore. He was just so tired. He missed Virgil. He missed how it was. He wanted Virgil. Deceit, a voice cooed, deceptiveness in its gentleness. You have someone waiting for you by the wall, a device that you hurry. You're running out of time. If you say tick-tock, Deceit said without opening his eyes, I'm going to remove myself from the situation. He wasn't afraid of fading. The voice fell silent. But he could still feel the residential amusement seeping through his thoughts. It wasn't his amusement. It was his emotion. Not of it was his. He wasn't himself anymore. His body was nothing but a hijacked vessel for some nameless voice that had an obsession with clocks. His dignity was burned away hard and fast, and now deceit was reduced to a shadow of Remus, feral and desperate and snarling. Uh, of course, it would be Remus that was waiting for him by the wall. Of course it had to be Remus, who had forgotten himself tangled up in this. The other side, cold and never, help him when it came to picking the wrong side. This time, he'd chosen Deceit's side. Deceit really didn't know what that said about this whole situation. Best not keep him waiting. He sighed to the shadows. They squirmed in agreement, twisting around the limbs as he tugged him through his aching, yawning sense of nothing. He would never be able to adjust to the weightless sensation that accompanied his travel through the darkness. It made sense in a way. Everything in the real world was so heavy and tiring. It was only fair that the cool, dark places of Thomas's thoughts would be light and fluffy and empty. What deceit wouldn't give to escape from the darkness, it wasn't possible, of course. Trying would only bring pain and fear. Deceit wouldn't be able to live through that again. But still, oh, what a delightful thought to entertain. If he ran, if he finally got out, to find Virgil, and he'd apologize, 
and he'd find Thomas, and he would finally tell the host the truth. That was the first step, wasn't it? The first step to not being a dark side. Break the cycle. Virgil could help him with that. You're thinking dangerous thoughts again, Deceit. Remus drawled from somewhere beyond Deceit's sight. The shadows hadn't cleared enough yet. Don't. Don't risk it. We both know how it went last time. Yes. Yes, Remus's warning had a merit. For once, Deceit needed to listen to the Duke. After all, it had been Remus who had, who had been forced to turn him over to the others, and it had been Remus that stripped away Deceit's power before forcing him into the swirling black abyss beyond the wall. Deceit had come back changed, and he knew that Remus knew. Deceit's lip curled. You doubt my loyalty so easily. Remus grinned a wicked grin, his face aligned with a sharp and heathered glee. Oh, deceit, he crooed dramatically. Don't think I can't see through you. I know what you think about. I know why you really spent so much time chasing after Virgil and his precious light sight friends. Something cold rocked his nails across the back of deceit's mind and he was flinched away, feeling his joints lock and his eyes go wide. Remus's manic facade faltered. Do not forgive me. Something whispered in the dark remains of the wall. I am here, and I am listening, and I will come for both of you. Deceit scowled down the shards. Shut up. Remus kicked a piece for good measure. Chapter 9 Remus blinked, utterly thrown by his companion's sudden and inexplicable f fondness of Greek tragedies. What? He managed intelligently. Deceit barely spared him a glance. Medea. Come now, Remus. Surely you see the similarities. Medea was scorned and abandoned by her husband, traded in for some newer and shinier and better. It's not so unlike our situation with Virgil. D. I will encourage your comparison once you murder and some children and poison some royalty. <laughs> your prince brother is a prince, is he not? Remus's lips tightened, an uneasy expression flickering across his face. You aren't going to poison a Roman, no matter how tempting it is. Not even to get back at Virgil. The seat glanced at him coolly, the Thin strips of shadow curling around his fingers and pressing against a scale burdened cheek. His eyes were glowing faintly, belaying his agitation. Is this brotherly love I sense, dearest Duke? His voice was disgusted, and his mouth curled into a scowl, scornful scowl. Remus jolted with a flush and indignation that zapped from his bloodstream. No, he denied quickly. He didn't care for Roman. It was the exact opposite. He must have been love for his pathetic, weak-minded brother to get taken away and locked up behind the wall, like the seed had been for so long. But poisoning him? Killing him? Remus had his limits. Deceit turned away and gathered a few pieces of the wall in his back hands. The shadows around him recoiled, tendrils and pure black scraping along his skin in an attempt to flee a, the eerie energy. All of us could have been so much more, Deceit murmured gently. We could have done so much more. We just had to let the wall down. Ah. Uh, Remus had a feeling... He knew what was starting to change within his composition. His companion. Of course, one couldn't spend much time by the wall and not start to mutate within themselves. What happened to you? He asked casu casually, fidgeting disinterest as he sat across him, cross-legged, and picked at his black fingernails. He'd never been able to get them the way Virgil used to. The sea made a small questioning noise. Well, Remus continued, 
You nearly did the same thing Virgil did. We locked you behind the wall as punishment. Remember? Oh, I remember. Remus hummed softly. Remus scratched at a piece of nail polish that was flaking off. Well, what happened? You came back with shadows etched into your skin, blood staining your teeth. That doesn't happen from doing nothing. Deceit turned from crouching and smiled. Remus did not get afraid. But seeing his friend, something suspiciously like terror flawed at his frozen heart. Deceit smiled, was lopsided, and too wide. There were too many teeth. Remus could almost imagine poison sliding down those barely visible fangs. This was the deceit who had crawled out of the darkness. This was the deceit that promised nothing but darkness and bad things. I sat in the darkness, almost a seat said, still sounding caring and soft. I sat, and I looked, and the darkness looked back. I think Virgil could benefit from an experience like that, don't you? Remus frowned, resting his elbows on his knees and staring up at the, his companion. Seaton merely gathered some more pieces of the wall. That sounds like... Almost as he'd smelled, turned venomous. I think it's time we rebuild the wall. The seat could tell that Remus didn't like the idea. The Duke's nose scrunched up, apprehensive evident on his features. God, Remus was a softy, just like his brother. Granted, Remus was often more tolerable than Remus simply because he was so stupid and just he'd love to play games with him. He would never actually poison the royal. He had standards. I understand that you weren't pleased with this plan. His voice was low and his shadows wrapped around his neck in response. Remus jumped to his feet and he sensed a real emotion swept away and hid him behind a manic facade. Deceit was more amused than concerned. If Remus wanted to pretend, who was to see to stop him? Last time, it took all the dark sides to put the wall up together. What makes you think that we could do it between the two of us? A fair point. Dissy could coincide that it was to be difficult. I have a feeling our new friend will lend us some strength, he said easily, anticipating a cold touch against the back of his thoughts. He laughed darkly. And I've changed since our last attempt with the wall. All will be well, grand old duke. Remus scowled. It'll take a lot of power. That's all I'm saying, you know? Deceit waved a hand f flippantly. No, brother. Of course, I will need to have my own reserves for my <laughs> other projects. But it shouldn't be anything too damaging. Other projects? Remus repeated, narrowing his eyes. Deceit didn't even try and play innocent. What games are you playing, Deceit? Such a loaded question for so early on the partnership. Deceit's lips curled as he tilted his head, staring at Remus with keen eyes. It was fair enough, he supposed. Remus had a right to know, but some viciously petty part of Deceit wanted him to flounder. How delightful it would be to watch Remus get torn apart and put back together by the darkest, deepest, hidden parts of Thomas's consciousness. Deceit was oh so tempted. He sighed. Alas, he was obligated to share so that both of them would get out of this entire situation in one piece. They threw the way through Virgil is his friends, he answered reluctantly. Remus's mouth twitched, but he withheld his mocking laughter. Deceit allowed a cruel smile. We've already tried Roman. Your work is quite excellent. Remus sketched a bow, grinning. Oh, why, thank you. I do love messing with my dearest brother. He's so skittish. It's almost pathetic. Deceit was wise. Deceit very wisely did not say that Remus' mostly one-sided rivalry with Roman was pathetic, and that he actually felt bad for Roman because the world's fair fear was genuine every time Remus showed up. Instead, Deceit said, you know that Logan will be no help to our cause. He's too... 
calm, rational. I like him, Remus said. His neutral energy. Imagine how powerful we could be if we could make him a dark side like us. The seed would rather fade, but okay. He gritted his teeth, managing not to spit at Remus's face. He would rather... Undignified. Hence, he emphasized, Patton. Virgil values Patton's opinions, and even Thomas's. Turning Patton against him would force him to isolate himself, and that, my dearest Remus, is when we strike. Remus's answering smile was genuinely terrifying. If deceit were anyone but himself, he may... actually feel disconcerned or unsettled. Unfortunately, he was who he was, and thus Remus just looked a little demented. Just he wrinkled his nose as he held out a few of the larger pieces of the wall to his companion. Our first decision? Are we again entirely or simply mending? Remus took the offered fragments, his breathing stuttering his own energies connected with the resistible power left in the pieces. Mending would make it weaker, he said, staring down at the luminescent slabs of bonded dark matter. Completely reconstructing it will ensure that there are no fault lines or cracks. We will be drained rather quickly, Deceit hated to admit it, but his power wasn't limitless. His power came from Thomas, which meant that his strength was slowly waning. Though, damn white sides had somehow managed to lend their host some strength. I'm strong, Remus, but not that strong. Remus's grin stretched wider. Then, we don't use our powers. Well, not entirely. Hm. Elaborate. Remus handed the pieces back to Deceit. He patted them meaningfully. Well, we have some batteries right here. I say we use them. Once you begin, the voice from the void hissed suddenly, interrupting their conversation. I will turn my influence on Virgil. You must finish the wall and tap him behind it, or our deal will be complete. No, Deceit said instinctively. Remus raised an eyebrow. Deceit breathed in deeply. Leave Virgil for the moment. Let me focus on Patton, and on the wall. Once it is built, once it is built, any effect the heightened dark energies have had on Virgil will fade, and he will be strengthened against us. It is of the essence sake. You're afraid? Leave Virgil to me. If you want to ensure we succeed, then lend us your energy, so that we can all get the wall built. The voice from behind the void fell silent in reluctant agreement, and Deceit turned to Remus, who blew out a heavy breath. Holy shit, the Duke said. Deceit, I hope you know what the hell you're doing. Oh, Deceit knew exactly what he was doing. He just wasn't doing what he promised. He just needed to get the wall rebuilt. Everything would be okay after that. Thank you so much for listening. Like I said, you really should go check out the whole series and books and things on Beckett's Wattpad. She is so cool. Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, so yeah, you, you should go to do to do do that. <laughs> if you enjoyed this book, uh, you could go to my social media links in the description below. We could find my Wattpad and, you know, my social media such as my Twitter, my Instagram. We also have a Discord for this channel, which is pretty boppin' if you ask me. I also have a second channel where I go live. If you look on your screen, you should see a link to my regular channel, my live channel, my Wapad playlist, and a random video. I don't know what's going to be there. Whoops. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Stay tuned till next week for the final episode of Bad Moon Rising. And until next time, do your best.